Today, we are talking about the blessing of forgiveness. And that is exactly what forgiveness is. It is a tremendous blessing. God is so gracious. God is so merciful that if we simply confess our sins, scripture says that God is faithful and just to forgive us. I got to tell you what I appreciate most about forgiveness is that not only does God have the power to forgive us, God desperately wants to forgive us. Scripture says that God is not slack concerning his promises, but God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. God literally wants to save everybody, and yes, that includes you. So I don't know where you're at tonight, and God, you might be on your way to heaven, or you might be struggling with the disappointment and the shame of past mistakes. I want to encourage you. I want to give you hope. You can give it to God, and the blessing of forgiveness is waiting for you and a new life in him. Listen, we've got an amazing lesson on today. I'm excited. Let's see what God has for us. I'm gonna hang on. Come on. Want to take this time and welcome you to another episode of Just Teach. If this is your first time visiting the channel, I want to extend a very heartfelt welcome to you. Certainly make yourself at home. If you have any comments, if you have any questions, if you have any prayer requests, by all means, the comment section is for you. We certainly appreciate the engagement. And to everyone, as always, certainly want to ask that you like, share, and subscribe to the channel. All of these things go such a long way in helping us spread the message of the gospel all around the world. And as always, wanted to let you know that notes, lesson notes are available to this study in the description of this video. So if you want to click and download those, you can follow along as we go to today's lesson. And certainly we are just simply helpers one to another. So with today's lesson, we are continuing in the winter quarter of the Union Gospel Press Sunday School book. We have been working with the theme of God's great blessings. We have been discussing blessings that God has ordained and established since the beginning of time. And this has been just a tremendous journey. With this unit, we are discussing the blessings of the gospel. What type of blessings come into our lives by virtue of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ? Well, you can tell by the title of today's lesson that one benefit of the gospel is that we are able to attain and receive forgiveness of sin and certainly enter into a new life of Christ. Listen, if you've been saved any amount of time, you know that a life in God is the best thing that ever happened to you. So this this is a great lesson, just talking about the blessing of forgiveness. I don't, I don't know about you, but when, when I gave my life to God, I was a teenager. But even as a teenager, I was so relieved to just be able to just give all of my problems and all of my mistakes to God. Because yes, even as a young person, you can do a lot of damage uh, early in life. And it was just a tremendous relief. Uh, scripture truly does say that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And that's exactly what I felt. I felt tremendous relief. So I, I, I trust and believe that uh, you had a similar experience when you came to faith. So, um, but with today's lesson, we are exploring the book of First John. This is a great book. It is. It is a short book, uh, but you don't have to be. <laughs> you don't have to be big and long to be powerful. Uh, the book of John was authored by the Apostle John. Uh, John wrote five books in the New Testament. He wrote the Gospel of John and then 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and then, of course, the book of Revelation. So uh, being that he contributed to five books out of 27 books of the New Testament, he is a major author in the New Testament. So it certainly is beneficial to understand the writings and the approach to writing of the Apostle John and just just to really observe, you know, that it is, has always been the agenda of John to establish the person and the deity of Jesus Christ. So we've got a really good book on our hands. We've got a good lesson on our hands. Um, John, in this text, 
much like Paul, you know, when Paul would write letters, he's, he was often addressing an issue that was going on at that time. Now, Paul would normally write a letter probably to a church, probably to a specific church, to a specific people addressing a specific issue. John, with his book, is more or less addressing the overall spiritual climate of the Christian church at this time. So it's, it's, it's a little bit different, but certainly very valuable because it gives us a lens onto what's going on in the early church. Uh, most scholars estimate that John is writing this book right around the turn of the century. So John is a little bit older. It's a little bit later in life. But what I think is most interesting to observe is that John has likely observed a few generations coming into the church. If, if the church would have been established when John was probably in his late teens, early 20s, by now, at the turn of the century, a few generations, there's there's been some sons and some daughters and maybe even some grandkids that have come into the church by virtue of birth. They didn't witness the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. They, they are simply operating in a faith that has been given to them from their parents. So essentially, they're pew babies. You know, and when you have a church that is young, but is established, if you will, and you have people who are trying to understand what is this Jesus person? What is this Jesus character? There could be some opportunities to where some confusion could take place, or maybe they are susceptible to outside influences. And maybe somebody like an apostle John would have to write a letter to help shore up some confusion and to deal with some problems. And that's exactly what he's doing. So what, what, what are we seeing with first John chapter one, or what do we see with, with John's writings in general? Well, there's, there's two things that, that John is having to deal with. Number one is that he's having to deal with secular and contemporary philosophies that are trying to infiltrate the faith, but then he's also having to deal with false teachers. So he's having to deal with philosophical schools of thoughts that are trying to maybe dismantle and maybe confuse people's theology and what they believe about the person of Jesus Christ. But then there were some straight up false teachers who were twisting the theology. And we're going to get into a little bit in today's lesson. And, and John goes far in not only calling them false teachers in first john chapter 2 john referred to them as antichrist M amen antichrist meaning that anybody that is against the messiah anybody that is against the person in the deity of jesus christ you are not for christ you are against christ you are antichrist and just to be clear these false teachers were so adamant about what they believed and about what they were teaching that they were no longer a part of the Christian church. That's why John wrote in 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, where he said, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For had they been of us, they would have no doubt continued with us. He's talking about these false teachers. He's called, talking about these people that were anti-Christ. He's saying that they were no longer a part of of the Christian community there, which is really important because one thing we're going to talk about later in today's text is that how when you believe the same thing about Christ, it facilitates fellowship. Amen. So we're, we're going we're gonna to get into that in just a moment. So what were some of these outside philosophies that were influencing people's theology? Well, we're not going to get too deep into it, but most historians and most Bible scholars, they have pinpointed one particular philosophy called Gnosticism. And what Gnosticism believes is that the spiritual plane is very superior and anything that is material, material or fleshly is inferior. And so the reason why that was having such an issue with the early church is that most people would superimpose Gnosticism to say that there's no way that Jesus could have been God. Because if Jesus was God and God came in the form of flesh, flesh is so deplorable. Flesh is so disgusting. It's so sinful and, and wrong that there's no way that a God could exist in flesh. So they would go so far as to say either Jesus was not God or Jesus was God but did not manifest in flesh. And that was swaying what people believed about God. Now, let's think about this for a second. Because 
we still have secular thought that causes problems in today's church. And we can't get into all of them in this in this lesson, but I, I want to talk about one in particular, and that is how pop culture romanticizes sin. Pop culture romanticizes the devil. It, it romanticizes demons. And we, and we don't always think about it. It doesn't always jump out at us because what it is is we might see movies or we might see TV shows that simply paint the devil in a positive light. There's a, there's a very popular movie that just came out recently called Black Adam. Uh, uh, the Rock is playing Black Adam. And where does this superhero get his powers from but from the, the, the spirits that represent the seven deadly sins? Well, he and, and they're saying this Black Adam is a hero. There, there, was a, there was a popular hero that came out some years ago when I was younger called Spawn. Spawn literally made a deal with Satan and Satan gave him powers to exact revenge uh, for his family as long as he would go out and do the bidding of Satan. And this Spawn character is supposed to be a superhero. We There's a popular show out now called Lucifer, literally the devil. But the devil isn't bad. The devil goes around solving cases and helping people, romanticizing sin. Trying to paint sin in a positive light. There, it's it's even in cartoons. There's there's a popular cartoon. It's a it's an anime cartoon out right now called The Seven Deadly Sins. And in one of the seven deadly sins is in love with a princess, and all of the other seven deadly sins help protect the kingdom of this princess from other people that would come in and try to attack them. So what, what are they doing? They're saying that even though it's sin, because sin is in love, well, what's wrong with love? Because love is love. And even though love is, is sin, we want to support it. We want to romanticize it. This, this is what goes into the church. These, these, these are outside influences. And what happens is, is people can sit up and watch this stuff on TV and in their minds, they don't realize they're being programmed to be sensitive towards the devil. So what it is, is that and, and when what you end up having is that when preachers try to stand in pulpits and try to preach against sin, they run into a wall. They run into a problem because you have a people that are so used to seeing the devil in a positive light. Like, what, well, what's, what's wrong with it? Why, why can't uh, homosexuals get married? What's wrong with that? I saw a homosexual couple on TV and it looked great. Sin is romanticized. So I want you to understand that just what, what John is, was writing about in the early church, that, that's some of the same hurdles that we face in today's church. And we have to be careful. We have to be careful and apply what John is going to get into in, in John chapter one to make sure that we are all on the same page, believing the same thing so that we can have fellowship. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the father and was manifested unto us so at the opening of this letter with the first two verses we're already seeing that john's style of writing is very different to that of the apostle paul apostle paul always identifies himself at the start of his letters and we're not seeing that here with first john chapter one uh paul Paul's writing always followed a very classical Greek approach to writing letters, whereas John, really, he's just hitting the ground running. He's just immediately uh, writing to address whatever issue it is that he was trying to talk about. And that issue is very clear from the beginning. He is addressing the, the deity of Jesus Christ, and he's addressing the fact that Jesus did come in the form of flesh and did manifest himself as man now how is john opening this letter he says that which was from the beginning now there's there's two things that john could be saying with this number one he could be saying that jesus is god and that god is eternal and that god exists at a time and that jesus was there from the beginning and um and that would really follow in line with what john wrote in the gospel of john where it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god so 
that's what he could be saying right there. What's likely that he's saying is that from the beginning, we believe that Jesus is God and that God, uh, that Jesus did manifest himself in the form of flesh. And he's contrasting this, this Gnosticism or these false teachings. He's saying that this is a new thought. This is, this is a new belief that they're trying to establish. So he's contrasting the beginning belief versus this new stuff. And he's saying from the beginning, which we have heard, in which we have seen with our eyes and have looked upon. He's he's saying from the beginning, we were eyewitnesses of the person of Jesus Christ. And that is one thing that affords the apostles' ministry to be superior in that they were able to witness the person of Jesus. They saw Jesus. They literally saw him because we have to understand that, first of all, all of the apostles were Jews and that according to Jewish cultures, an eyewitness carries tremendous weight. According to scripture, it says out of the mouths of two or three witnesses, every word is established. So if you are a witness to something, you carry a lot of authority. So he's saying we witnessed, we witnessed Jesus. He says, we have heard, we have seen with our eyes, and we have looked upon him. He said, I touched him with my hands. He said, there's, there's no way in the world that you could confuse or try to persuade me that Jesus did not manifest himself fully in flesh. There were some people that are trying to say that Jesus maybe just kind of was a spirit that was seen, a very vivid spirit, but he was not flesh. John is saying, uh-uh, ain't no way. He said, I held him with my hands. I, I know that he came. He is the word of life. So it is, this, is, this is John giving a very clear defense in the, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. John chapter 1 verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. This, this is what he's dealing with. So in verse number 2, it says, for the life was manifested. That word manifested means to reveal, but not just to reveal, but to show something that was hidden. So in other words, again, he's speaking to the eternity of Jesus Christ and saying that we didn't see Jesus until he was manifested. But now that he's manifested and we've seen him, now we can bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which is of the Father and is manifest unto us. He is connecting Jesus back to the Father. And he's saying, he, he's saying, look, we cannot give credence or we cannot lend support to this new belief that's out right there that is trying to pull down Jesus as God. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Now, John is making it clear here in verse 3 that the goal of him writing is so that everyone can have fellowship. That's really what he's establishing in verses 1 through 4, that the goal of the writing is so that everybody can be on one accord. It's interesting to observe because what is implied here, but doesn't necessarily just jump out at you, is that he's not writing this to convince anybody into salvation. He's saying that I'm literally writing to people that are already saved. These people are already in the church, and I'm trying to make sure that those who are in the church believe the same thing. Why? So that we can all have fellowship with one another. Now, I think that that's so important. I got to put a pin there because even in today's contemporary church, there, there are some that would try to blend the Christian faith with other faiths that don't believe that Jesus is God. There are some churches out there that would try to want to blend Christianity with with the Muslim faith or with Judaism. And they want to try to create, you know, this this hand holding, if you will, uh, you know, across religions and say, oh, well, we all believe the same God. No, we don't. We don't believe in the same God, because if you don't believe that Jesus is God, your God is different from my God. We can't have fellowship with one another unless we believe the same thing about Jesus. And I, I'll never forget, I was watching um, 
Aretha Franklin's funeral a few years ago and uh, Louis Farrakhan got up to speak and he was trying to present this argument that even as a Muslim, he's saying, oh, I believe in Jesus too. You don't believe in Jesus the way I believe in Jesus because I believe that Jesus is God in flesh and I believe that he is the rem the source of the remission of our sins. That's not the same thing that Muslims believe. So because we don't believe the same thing about Jesus, I don't I don't care who it is. It could be another church claiming to be a Christian church. If you don't believe the same thing that we believe about Jesus, can't have fellowship with you. And we have to be adamant about that. I, I know that we live in a day and time where everybody just wants to be really, you know, soft, you know, about their convictions. And they just they just want everybody to just get along. Listen, Jesus said, I didn't come to speak peace. He said, I came to send a sword into this world. So understand that sometimes what you believe about God is going to cause you to lose fellowship with certain people. That's OK. Because you you have to stand firm because the only way that the truth of the gospel can be preached is if those who believe are standing together. Amen. So here it is. He's saying if we believe the same thing, we will have fellowship. But what is blessed about this, what is amazing about this is that he's saying that there is no fellowship with God and not having fellowship with us. There's no having fellowship with us and not having fellowship with God. When we believe the same thing, we come together as natural people and then we also come together in fellowship with God and we are all together on the same page. It's a beautiful thing, but it all it all stems from believing the same thing. Now, Paul is getting, I mean, sorry, John is getting ready to turn a corner here uh, in the next verse and he's beginning to establish what are these beliefs? Then this is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Now with verse five, John is introducing an additional concept about God in this letter and he's saying that God is light. He's saying that God is light and that in God is no darkness. Now, it's clear that John is drawing this dichotomy to say that if you are going to be in God, that you are going to be in light and that everybody is not in God. Some people are in darkness. So understand, we're talking about this concept of fellowship, and he's already leading you down a path to let you know that if you're going to be in light, you're not going to have fellowship with everybody because some people are going to be in darkness. Now, it's a beautiful illustration that John is very consistent in using in his writings. If you recall in John, uh, the, the, the gospel of John, chapter one, verse four, it says in him was life and the life was a light of man. Him being Jesus, the source of our light as believers is Jesus. Scripture says that we are the light of the world, a city that is set upon a hill that cannot be hid. What is our light? The better question is, who is our light? And that is Jesus. When people see us, they don't see us. They see Jesus. We are not a light source. We do not produce light. We reflect light. We give people Jesus. And when they see us, they see him. So not only, so not only is God our light because God is light, but John is very clear. If you read John 1 and 5, it says, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended not. He's trying to draw a dichotomy and again a separation between light and darkness. It's the same thing that he's doing in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, where it says, And in, in, in him is no darkness at all. He's, he's saying that there's a separation. John, John is trying to, trying to help believers have thick skin. He's trying to help believers be strong in their convictions and say, understand, look, you can't be friends with everybody. It's, it's not going to work. Uh, uh, Paul did the same thing. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse 14, it says, be ye not unequally yoked together with what? Unbelievers. So we're already talking about there's a difference between believers and unbelievers. We're talking about there's a difference between light and darkness. It says, for what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion have light with darkness? So he's saying in order for you to have fellowship with someone and they have to be light, they have to be righteous, they have to be a believer. Otherwise, there is no fellowship. And that's that's a very real concept to understand, because, you know, we could have friends that are unbelievers. We, we can have 
family members that are unbelievers, but there is a disconnect in that relationship. Why? Because they don't believe and there's a lack of fellowship there. There's, there's always, until they come to a place of faith, until they come to a place where they believe that, that that cohesion that could be there is not quite there. But all when you come in contact with other believers, I, I don't care what the situation, Jesus said, who is my brother? Who is my sister? Who is my mother? But them that do the will of the Father. Amen. I have fellowship with people that believe like I believe. Amen. So, so John is drawing a very clear line here and he's trying to say, look, these people that don't believe like we, like we believe, they are in darkness. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. In the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanseth us from all sin. So with these verses, I want to take the time and maybe ask you, what does it mean to walk in the light? What does it mean to, to walk in darkness? Because we are getting into conversations of uh, Christian character. We're, we're getting into the, the conversation of how you carry yourself as a Christian when you come to faith. And there are there are varying conversations about this. And this is so important to the Christian faith. It's so important to to our our doctrine and to theology and what you believe and know about God's expectation for a believer as you live your life in him. What does it mean to walk in the light? What, what does it mean? Because I, I've even heard uh, a preacher say one time that walking in the light means that you continue to sin. You're just aware that you sin. The, the, the light reveals your sin. But when you're in darkness, you sin. You just don't know about it. But when you walk in the light, you just continue to sin. And now you're aware of it. Now, I, I'm trying to figure out how do, how do you work that into verse number seven? Because at verse number seven says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, he being Jesus, what do you mean you continue to say? Is, is, is Jesus participating in your sin because you're in the light with him and you just continue to sin? I, I'm not I'm not seeing the connection there. So what what is God's expectation or 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 what is the understanding of what it means to to walk in the light though the first thing i want you to understand is that after you give your life to the lord understand your flesh is not going to be redeemed your flesh does not get regenerated it's not going to go to heaven with you in genesis chapter 3 verse 19 you can read it when you have a uh, have an opportunity it says that we were formed from dust and from into dust we will return that means that you were, were made from the dirt of the earth and your flesh is going to return to the dirt. First Corinthians 15 and in 50, it says, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. So what it's saying is the reason why your flesh will never be redeemed and it won't go to heaven with you is because it is corrupt. So now we're placing a valuation on flesh. So I want you to understand this because even though you're saved, you still live in flesh, but your flesh is not redeemed. Oh, okay. So I want you to understand. That's the first thing about flesh. The other thing I want you to understand is that as a believer, God never takes away the choice of sin. Amen. Where are we getting that from? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39, it says, but we are not of them that draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. That means that if you believe and you are walking in God, he's saying that you have the capacity to draw back into perdition, to draw back into damnation in the judgment of God. So he said, so that's letting us know right there that you can come to faith in God, but there is the capacity for you to lose faith with God because you are drawn back into perdition. He never takes away the ability for you to sin. 
1 Corinthians 9 and 27, Paul wrote and says, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself would be a castaway. Paul is saying that I could be saved and I can preach the word of God, but if I am not careful, I myself could slip up and do the very things that I preached against. And when I stand before God, I will be a castaway. I will be rejected by God. I will be denied acceptance by God because I didn't keep under my flesh. This is what we need to understand. You're saved, but your flesh is not regenerated. You're saved, but you still have the capacity to sin. So then the question is, what is God's expectation for your walk? What does it mean to walk in the light? Romans chapter six, verse one. What did Paul write? The very same Paul that wrote Romans chapter seven in verse number six, number one, he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse number two, God forbid. So he's establishing a very clear precedent right there that we don't continue in sin. If God forbid that we continue in sin, he's writing here that God's expectation is that you abstain from sin. First Corinthians chapter three, verse six, it says, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. I'm sorry, not 1 Corinthians, 1 John chapter, chapter 3, verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. What is the expectation? The expectation is that you don't sin. Because if you abide in him, you don't sin. If you walk in the light, Understand that walking in the light is that which you habitually do. You walk in the light. Jude, verse 24, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. How is it that you are able to walk in the light? How is it that you are able to walk free and separated from sin? How is it that you're able to stand righteous because it is God that is keeping you? I wish I had time to get into this. We're, we're, we might talk about it in a later verse, but the reason why so many people struggle with the concept of walking in righteousness, walking in the light, and walking in a life that is free and separated from sin is because they're putting all of the, of the burden on themselves. Well, I can't do that because I'm in flesh. Is your flesh more powerful than God? That's what you have to understand. It is God that is keeping you. It is God that gives you the power to walk righteous. So how is it that you're able to stand? Because it is him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless. We're not done. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you such as common to man. That we're, we're, what, how is it that man sins when you are drawn away by lust and temptation and entice? That is the reason you sin. Temptation. Do you have the capacity and the ability to resist temptation? It says, but God is faithful who will not suffer us to be tempted above that which we are able. He says, but will, will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. We have the ability to bear temptation and to resist temptation. It's scripture says literally resist the devil and he will flee from you. If we have the power to resist the devil, if we have the power to endure temptation and to stand, that's what it means to walk in the light. Amen. You know, some people would want us to, to believe less than that and would want us to believe that we can't help but sin. We have no choice but to sin. But I want to submit to you. The reason why so many people believe that they have no choice but to sin is because that's what's preached to them. Understand that if the truth is preached to you, then you will have faith. But if you don't have the truth preached to you, then you won't have faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. I'm trying to help you understand that the life that you live is a result, not necessarily of the power of God, not necessarily of the word of God. It's according to your faith. And if people don't preach to you the word of God, then you won't have faith. Romans chapter 10. Hmm. Let's read this. 
It says in verse number 14, how shall they call on him who they have not believed and how shall they believe in him who they have not heard and how shall they hear without a preacher? You will call on God based on what has been preached to you. Verse 17, I got to I got to go. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The faith that you have comes by what you have heard. And if somebody preached to you and let you know that you can stand, you can stand in righteousness, you can stand in the light, you can stand through temptation, you can resist the attack of the enemy if that is what has been preached to you, then you will know that you can resist sin. This is what this is what John has given him. In 1 John uh, chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, that's why he's saying this. And this is all made possible in verse number 7. Because the blood of Jesus is what cleanses us from sin. Walking in the light is not what cleanses us from sin. It is the result of being cleansed. I want you to get that. You have been cleansed by the blood. People don't preach the blood of Jesus anymore. You got you to gotta understand that it is, it is the, the power of the blood of Jesus that breaks the yoke of sin from our lives. And because Jesus is the perfect sacrifice, he does for us what no other sacrifice could do. We're talking about walking in the light. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. With these verses in verses 8, 9, and 10, John is addressing what can be called the total depravity of man. That is the reality is that everyone is in need of salvation no one can say that they are without sin. We are all born in sin and shaping in iniquity. So when Paul, when I'm sorry, when John says that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us, he's he's really uh, lending back to what Paul talked about in Romans chapter three. In Romans chapter three, verse 10, he says, as it's written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Paul was arguing that everybody, both Jew and Gentile, is in need of salvation. Everybody needs deliverance. And that's when he went on to say in Romans 3 and 23, when he said, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No one can say that they're without sin. Uh, Paul went on to say later uh, in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, it says, wherefore, as by one man sin into the world and death by sin. We're talking about Adam and the original sin. We are all counted as sinners because of Adam. So it, I mean, so it, even if people want to sit up here and try to lie to themselves and say, well, I, I've never sinned at any point in my life, it doesn't it wouldn't even matter. That's a lie anyway, but it wouldn't even matter because Adam sinned. So because of Adam's sin, we were all considered sinners. We are all guilty and deserving of death. So here he is. He's addressing the, the total depravity of man and saying that we are in need of, the, of the, the blood of Jesus Christ. And understand this, John is writing to an early church that is being influenced by outside philosophies trying to reduce the deity of Christ and saying that Jesus either was not the Messiah or that Jesus did not come in flesh. So understand, he's trying to draw how important it is that Jesus came in flesh and that he did die on the cross. Why? Because it's his blood that saved us. And don't act like you don't need his blood because we all have sinned. We all need redemption from, from, uh, from sin. So then here we are with, with our key verse, with verse number nine, where he says, if we confess our sins, he, being God, is faithful and just to forgive us. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I, this is a salvation verse. And I promise you, if you got a pen and paper, I encourage you, write down 1 John 1 and 9. Because this, this is something that we can use to substantiate our faith. You know, one thing that is so common is that after we have given our lives to the Lord, sometimes we struggle with the guilt 
of our mistakes. Sometimes we struggle with, with the guilt of our past. And honestly, I believe that's why some people try to go so far as to say that even after they get saved, they're just, they just continue to sin and they believe that there's there's no hope of them not sinning is because they're just wrestling with this constant guilt. And sometimes when you're guilty, you feel unlovable. You feel unredeemable. You feel hopeless. So even though that you may have repented and asked God to forgive you, you don't really feel like you've been been forgiven but you have to understand that first of all God is faithful and he's just God is faithful meaning that God is always present God is always available God is consistent no matter who's been inconsistent in your life no matter who's been unavailable in your life that is not God God is faithful amen and then it says God is just which means God's not bending any rules to save you you know, sometimes we might think, well, yeah, you, you're just saying that stuff about me, but, you know, because you're my mom or you're my dad. And we think that there's nepotism going on. And sometimes we think that the blessings of our of our life, we didn't earn them. We don't deserve this. No, he's saying that God is just and that if God is forgiving you, you deserve you deserve forgiveness. Mm. I need somebody to receive that. You deserve forgiveness. God, God has exercised it in such a way that if you simply confess and bring your faults to him, he's saying you qualify for the forgiveness of God. That is so beautiful. That is so needed. And I'm so grateful for it. You know, I remember when I gave my life to the Lord, I, I, when I was down there praying and giving my life to God, I remember the elder that was praying me through. He was saying, just tell God that you love God. And I was in, in my mouth was saying it, but in my mind, I was having a hard time believing. I was like, man, how would God believe that I love him? And my life up to this point hasn't shown the love of God. I, I haven't demonstrated a love for God up to this point. But then I remember studying scripture very soon after that in John chapter 14, where it says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. And I was so encouraged. I was like, oh, I can show God that I love him by living according to his word. And that way, when I lift up my hands and say, God, I love you, I can lift my hands in confidence because I've been walking according to the word of God. But it, it all started with me asking God for forgiveness and me giving my life to God. And God is so faithful. I want to encourage somebody with this. I want you to understand that the power of God in your life is according to the sacrifice of Jesus and that the sacrifice of Jesus is certainly a perfect sacrifice. I want you to read this. Uh, in, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, it says, How much more shall the blood of Christ through the eternal spirit offered himself without the spirit of God? Look at this. Purge your conscience from dead works to the serving of the living God, to the serving of the living God. When you have been saved, when you have confessed and, and you have been redeemed and forgiven of God, it is the power of the blood of Jesus that purges your conscience. That means that we, you don't even have a desire to do the things that you used to do. Sometimes you hear people testify and they say, man, when I gave my life to the Lord, I don't even desire to do those things that I used to do. Why? Because their conscience has been purged. And I, and I just like to believe that somebody out there might be listening and you're thinking, I would love to be purged of these desires because I just find myself doing the things that I don't want to do. I need help from these things. You know, scripture tells us that the pleasures of sin, they only last for a season. That's the problem with sin. Sin feels good. If somebody tells you that they don't enjoy sin and they're not telling the truth, no, sin feels good. The problem is, is that that feeling is temporary. And, and what happens when we enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season and then it stops feeling good? What do you do? You leave that sin and go find a new sin. And then that sin feels good for a season. And when that stops feeling good, you leave that sin and go to another sin. And you just find yourself going from situation to situation to situation, never finding satisfaction. That's why people find themselves in, in, in sexual relationships and then they, they, they get with this person and it feels good for a season. 
How long is the season? I don't know. A, a few months, a, a, a week, sometimes a day. It's a one night stand. It feels good for a season and then they leave and then they go to another season of it. But until your conscious has been purged by the blood of Jesus, you, you, that desire will remain there. But when you give your life to the Lord, he can take that desire away. This is what this is what John is trying to tell that this is the blessing of God's forgiveness. It is a total renewal of new life. That's what our lesson title is, the blessing of forgiveness and a new life. It's going to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Everything that you've done in your past is forgiven. Everything that you've done in your past is washed away and you've been cleansed and you've been given a new mind and a new heart so that you can go on and live for God. And in verse number 10, it says, he says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. God said that we are in need of redemption. Jesus said that the purpose of him coming was to die. And the whole purpose of him dying is saying, because you're in need of deliverance. And if you say that you're not in need of deliverance, well, then you're making God out to be a liar. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandment. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word... In him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. John opens up chapter number two, continuing in the same thought from the previous chapter. And he's saying that uh, he writes these things so that you do not sin, so that ye sin not. So in other words, John ultimate goal is trying to get everyone to a place of fellowship. Remember that. That's what he opened up the, 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 the book talking about having fellowship with us and fellowship with God. But how can we have fellowship where well, we have to walk in the light? And the only way that we can say that we are walking in the light, he's saying that ye sin not. So this is this is the goal. Abstain from sin so that we can have fellowship with one another, so that we can have fellowship with God, so that we can continue to walk in the light. So he's saying in verse number one, he says, and if any man sin understand if as a conditional word and it always applies to the actions of man scripture says in second corinthians 5 and 17 therefore if any man be in christ it's not a guarantee that you're in christ it's if have you confessed your sins if you've confessed your sins then you've received forgiveness from god then you're in christ so then he says if any man sin it's not a guarantee that you will sin some people like to preach that, that you have no choice but to sin. He says, if any man sin. Yes, you are in flesh. Yes, flesh is corruptible and it will never be redeemed. And it has the power to influence your walk. But scripture says that if we walk in the spirit, we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So we, we have the capacity to resist sin. But he says, but we also have the capacity to sin. Amen. So he's saying, if you do understand this, he says you have an advocate with the father. There's a very popular word there. It is parakletos or is paraclete. This is the same word that John used in John chapter 14, uh, verse 16, I believe, where he says, and I'll send you another comforter. That's that's what the Holy Spirit was. And he's using this word to refer to Jesus now that our advocate with the father is Jesus. It is literally someone who's going to speak on the behalf of Jesus is our mediator that stands between us and God. How is it that we know that we have the capacity to be saved? It is by our advocate. It is by Jesus. So we have an advocate with the father that is Jesus Christ, the righteous. And then it says he is the propitiation of our sins. This is the New Testament word for atonement. It means that that God is satisfied. It means that God forgives. Amen. So how do we know that God forgives us? He releases us of what we owe. He releases us of our debt. We have been forgiven. Why? Because Jesus is our atonement for our sins. And not ours only, but also to the sins of the whole world. 
Amen. I, man, I wish I had time to talk about Calvinism right there because everybody has the opportunity to receive Christ. He died on the cross for the whole world. So then Paul, uh, John goes on in verses 3 through 5 to continue to encourage them to keep the commandments of God. Why? So that you can walk in the light. Hereby we know him if we keep his commandments. See, keeping God's commandments is fruit and it is proof that you are saved. Amen. That, and it's so important that we go on and do the word and the will of God. Some people believe that once you give your life to the Lord, you confess your sins, there, that there's no expectation or responsibility to go on and serve God. He's showing you otherwise. Because how do you know that you're saved? How do you know that you know God because you've kept his commandments? It's you walking in the light. It's you keeping the commandments that can feed your faith day by day so you can walk in confidence and know I belong to God. He that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Scripture says you will know a tree by the fruit that it bears. If someone says that they are a Christian but they do not keep the commandments of God, I'm not calling them a liar. John, in 1 John 2 and 4, John said they're a liar. And God spoke through John, so God is saying that they're a liar. You have to go on and do the work of God, do the will of God. But whosoever keepeth him, his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. My God, and hereby we know that we are in him. We, we, we can't get caught up in things that are not pertaining to matters of righteousness. We have to put a priority and keeping the commandments of God. Because how do you know that you've been forgiven of sin? How can you rest and enjoy the blessing of forgiveness but by doing the will of the Father? How do you know that you're forgiven? Some, some people have anxiety and they, and they struggle. You know, it's like, am I really saved? Well, go on and do the work of God. Then you know that you're saved. And when the enemy tries to come and attack you and tries to be, as scripture says, he's the accuser of the brother. When he tries to accuse you of your past and try to make you feel shame, you ain't got to feel shame. You ain't got to worry about it at all because you've been walking in the word and will of God and you know that you belong to him. Listen, that's our lesson for today. I certainly pray that something was said that encourages you and blesses you along the way. As always, I love you with the love of the Lord and we're praying for you. Yeah.